Sometimes you just gotta use what you have. Hello folks! Welcome back to my channel. My name is Stephanie Canada. If this is your first time here, yes indeed! That's my real last name! If you enjoy vintage, sewing, thrifting, and all other types of shenanigans, all laced with severely high doses of sarcasm, please click that subscribe button now, being sure to turn on the bell for post notifications. Now our dear Joanna Cole, may she rest in peace as of July 17th, 2020, who wrote The Magic School Bus, sculpted my early years. As a product of the 80s and raised in the 90s, I feel like that was part of the staple of the 90s child experience was the Magic School Bus. So what I'm doing today is I am going to make myself into a vague shape of Miss Frizzle. Now I will be using a vintage pattern for this and very much non-vintage fabric, but that is okay to do a little bit of mashup because one, using what you have is a great thing, and two, I mean, come on, sometimes you just gotta use what screams to be used. So let's go ahead and get started grabbing our coffees, and let's get started, shall we? Sometimes you just gotta use what you have. Oh, it totally didn't work. Hey, there it is. All right, let's do this. A journey to becoming the Frizz. In her epic words, take chances, make mistakes. And mistakes were made. Don't you worry, my friends. Come along with me now, and I'll show you how this ends. There are very few times in my sewing endeavors that I pause before starting a project. This was one of them, because this one involved me unfolding a factory folded pattern. To which my little pattern selling heart goes, <gasps> gasp, say it ain't so. And the rest of me goes, do it, do it, do it. You can tell which part one. Now for me, the most intriguing thing about this dress is that while it looks pristine for pocket town, when you go to the actual pattern layout, there is indeed no pocket. Well, in my dresses, that doesn't fly. Now heading over to my bedroom and laying the fabric on the floor, my favorite place to lay this, I then pin the back center piece to the fabric and with my friction pin, I'm gonna go ahead and trace around the actual lines. And then from there, I'll just sort of guess about a half inch out and cut away from there. This may or may not be why I had issues farther down the line, but we'll get to that. And forging ahead, flipping over to use the side back panels, <clears throat> just gonna emphasize that flipping over bit there. I move forward with my pattern cutting, this time making sure that each of the side panels was as close as it could be to on straight of grain, which was only so manageable, because I forgot that princess line dresses for me are ridiculously long. And that meant that I had to be careful because I didn't actually have quite enough fabric. Yeah. Wish I would have realized that sooner. And no proper sewist in 2020 is going to cut out an entire dress pattern and not cut out the matching mask. Hashtag pandemic style. Ain't it fun? Now, while I willy-nilly opened up that factory fold, I am not about to cut this sleeve. No way. So here you can see it on the pattern fabric, but I'm gonna go ahead and show you on the red fabric a bit more clearly what I did. Using my friction pen, I made little dots where the cut my sleeve length was, pulled back the pattern, and then did a tracing while trying to like connect the dots with the pattern piece. It worked, good enough. I'm not complaining. And the pattern is still in one piece.
And how did I add a pocket, you ask? Well, sort of like this. I used my hand as a guide, and just kind of willy-nilly drew the line where I thought the pocket might go. And then using my willy-nilly line, I made a copy of it on the same red fabric. And, well, I have a pocket. That's the end goal, right? Hello, friends. Welcome to day two. I have cut out all of my pattern pieces, uh, vaguely successfully. So I definitely had a little hiccup yesterday and didn't realize it until after I had cut everything out and didn't have any extra fabric. On the back panels, I definitely cut one of those pieces upside down because while I thought the print was two directional, thanks plums, you did me dirty. It's actually only one direction. So that means some part of this dress on the back will be completely upside down. Unfortunately, I don't have enough fabric to fix this, so I'm just going to close my eyes and pretend it's fine. You know, like large manufacturing companies do all the time. But yeah, um, it just also reminded me why I hate princess seams, because the pieces for me are so ridiculously long and complicated to cut out, and my fabric wasn't quite wide enough to just let me fold it over and knock these all out at once. It actually involved two sections, so I, my back hurt a little bit more because being on the floor that long was quite painful. But I am going to get started with some stay stitching, which I don't feel like you really need to see because, well, it's stay stitching. It's not that exciting. And I'm gonna get into sewing this puppy up for us. As Ms. Frizzle would say, to the bus! Oh, or sewing machine, whatever, you know, same thing. Ready and fresh, I grab my instructions, open up the pamphlet and bound buttonhole? But why? After staring at the instructions, I realized this was wholly for aesthetic purposes and I aesthetically do not care. So I moved on. Now, in an attempt to get these pockets correct, I did take my secondary piece and try and trace out where the bottom of the original pocket was. I was thinking that, oh, I'll match the notches and it will work perfectly fine. Uh, not really. But it's not so shallow that it can't hold things, but it's definitely not where those lines were supposed to be. And while my brain was desperately trying to figure out how exactly to make these pockets work, I jumped ahead to the next step in step one, because multi-steps are fun. Which says, Seam fronts at center front below large O, matching triple V. Which I found interesting that the notches weren't what I was matching, I was matching the O, but it worked. And while I was pinning, I realized that I had not actually yet seen what exactly the seam allowance was. So after an inordinate amount of time poring over these instructions and being embarrassed at how long it actually took me to find this, the seam allowance was a half inch. Yeah, in bold, in the black. Oh well, at least I found it before I started sewing anything. And I couldn't figure out why exactly my sewing machine was acting odd. The stitches were tensioning strangely, so I busted out my guide just for a giggles of let's check and make sure something is correct. And lo and behold, I have been threading my sewing machine incorrect the entire time I've owned it. Cool. I guess I should probably put it in correctly now. And let's just add salt to the wound of... My little notches mean nothing to me. There's no denotation as to which three, four, five, six, what that actually means. So I busted out my tape measure to remind myself what a half inch seam allowance was. It's the number four, in case you're curious on my machine. After I happily stitched that together, I open up the seam to realize, again, I am garbage at print matching. <sighs> I had even tried and it still failed pretty epically. I know I want a pocket. I don't really know how to do it, but I'm gonna figure it out. I'm just gonna go ahead and speed this process up for you, but I'm just going to acknowledge that that took me far longer than I would like to admit to figure out exactly how to pin this thing on and not have it look like crap. And honestly, 
I don't even really remember how I did it. I know it involved grabbing the entire piece and the pattern piece to attempt to figure it out. It's embarrassing, but I have a pocket, so I don't care. And with my pocket now succinctly sewn on and the curve clipped so that it doesn't look like hot garbage, I got a little on the cocky side and decided, yeah, let's just go ahead and pull this understitching, it'll be great. So as I'm doing the understitching, I'm happily sewing along and notice that something feels off. So I pull out the piece and realize that I have indeed sewn a giant lump into my understitching. So now I get to rip that all out and start over again. Did I tear out the entire line? Of course not. It's fine. It's all fine. I sewed over where it cut it off. It's perfectly fine, she says, not actually knowing. And now I'm back to the section where instructions actually matter again. This one says, seam side front two to front matching V and double V. Which was vaguely successful because I just sewed all the way down, including my pocket, so that I had one big giant seam. And the corners where I lined up the edge of the pockets aren't the prettiest, but they're not terrible, so I'll take it. And before I got to the next step of the instructions, I realized that I had done all of my marks in the Frixion pen, so I did have to slap some half, you know what, tailor's tacks in. The next instruction reads, press seam toward front, clipping as necessary, and top stitch from outside close to seam. And remember that fancy little pocket? It was at this point that I realized, if I wanted to top stitch this, I probably should have done these in a slightly different way. Like I should have top stitched the pocket and then lined up the top stitching for the side and then that all seemed a little too much. So I just top stitched to about where the pockets stop and I don't care because there are giant buttons that are gonna go there later. In trying to conserve my fabric, it looked like I only did a passable job because this giant white line that reads Cranston is still very, very visible in my bottom of my seam allowance, which I believe is now tucked in the hem. So I guess it's not that bad but I did have to sort of adjust how wide that was just so I didn't get any of that nasty white selvage poking out the dead center back of my dress. Continuing forth with the instructions, step two, seam back three to side back four, matching V and V. Seam dress at shoulders, matching V. And of course the next bit of this is where it gets a little exciting because they continue forward with the longer sleeve version of this as opposed to the short sleeve version. So if you're looking for the short sleeve version, you have to go to step number nine. It basically just reads, dress with short sleeves. See cutting instructions. Make same dress as three quarter sleeve. See step one. Seam back three to side back four, matching V and V. That sounds familiar. Seam dress at shoulders matching V. So basically they just like, here, jump around, have fun. The downside to the less amount of paper that you get with the instructions means that you don't get step by step for each individual dress. But eventually you figure it out and just start to look for it instead of being totally confused. It wouldn't be one of my sewing projects without at least one of the sets of darts not matching up even close. This is on the side seam of three and four. I'm not sure how I pulled this off, but I have a feeling it has something to do with the fact that I added that half inch 
to the back pieces and didn't really do a good job at adjusting where the dart goes. Oh well. Gotta get that bobbin check in. Oh right, I'm using the metal one this time. Never mind. P.S. There's black thread in there. I was really never going to see it. And after finishing off those seams, now you get to see just exactly how flipped those pineapples are. Yep. That's a thing that happened. I'm gonna go with it's the back of the dress and hopefully no one will notice. Except me. I'll know forever. And so will you. And now moving on to that shoulder seam, I didn't see anything wrong with what was going on. Until... Remember that time that I added those seams in the back of the dress and not the front? They're coming back to bite me right now. What I ended up doing was just easing them as much as I could, matching up the seams so that the seams didn't look completely wrong. And there's definitely some extra, um, fabric. But it's not so terrible that I can't live with it. But it's definitely noticeable to me. I also think that pesky addition meant that I had this extra little flap of fabric on the back part of my arm. It's not the end of the world to have a little bit more room, but it's definitely wigglier than I would like. Now instead of doing what the instructions say to leave open on the side for the zipper, I do my normal, I'm going to backstitch right at the top of where it wants me to put the zipper. Throw this to the largest setting, which is 4 on my machine. I normally sew at a 3. When I get down to the end where the zipper is supposed to end, I'm going to backstitch again, go back to the original stitch length, and continue on on my line. Because that's just how I prefer to do zippers. And now, I was hungry. So welcome to crappy lighting until day three. We're gonna start off by seaming the collar because that is the next step, which is seam collar at center back, matching double V. Seam facing the same. And in this case, since they did not capitalize facing, what they mean is the facing of the collar, which is your double piece. As opposed to in step four, where they capitalize facing, and that's the actual facing piece that goes in and is actually touching your body right at the V-neck. The next instruction reads, seam facing to collar except at V-edge. Trim seam, turn, and baste raw edges. Uh, did I do that? No, of course not. I did trim the seam, I did not baste a daggone thing. Now there was some type of odd gapping at the back center. I'm not exactly sure how that happened because I didn't adjust the inside of the back center at all. So everything where the collar laid was to pattern. So I'm guessing that was just a flaw from the factory. Ain't that the life story of every home sewist. Then it follows based collar to neck matching V at center back. Now while I did cut down the edges so that they would curve a little bit better, I actually basted something to a dress with my hand. I know I should do it more often, don't give me that look. Everyone takes their shortcuts. This one is normally mine. But this time I decided to step up my game. Because when there's a tin in a sewing room, you can be darn sure there are no cookies or biscuits in that tin. So diving into my bias and rickrack tin, I did find a lovely piece of red dead stock bias that I busted open for this project. 
Step four, seam facing five at center front below large O, matching V. Still not exactly sure what I was supposed to do there. I think I did it right, but I don't think so. You'll see. Turn under and stitch shoulder, side, and lower edges. Basically, turn all the edges so that way you don't have frayed edges while you're sewing. Baste facing to neck over collar, which I of course couldn't be bothered, that's what pins are for. Baste a strip of bias as facing to remaining neck's edge. Again, couldn't be bothered. That's what pins are for. Stitch as basted. Trim or seam, turn facing inside. Turn under raw edge of bias and slip stitch in place. Tack front facing at seams and corners. Which I did most of that at a much later time. I don't think I'm supposed to be able to see my finger through the dead center of where the facing is versus where the dress is. Well, I guess I'll have to hand stitch that together. And while the instructions don't note to understitch everything, I did opt to do that. And at this point, my machine was acting quite squirrely and making some distinctly bad noises. But I thought, nah, it's just acting up. It likes to do this on occasion. In three, two, one. Shit. Now my machine won't move. I guess I get to take it apart. At this point in my delirium, I'm really hoping that it's just something I have to oil and that maybe it's just a bent needle or something oil didn't y y you no, no, no. Something is very wrong. Take chances. Make mistakes. I don't think I was supposed to break my sewing machine. There was a brief moment of delirium while I considered hand stitching the rest of the dress. But I did come to my senses. So while cursing loudly at my now broken sewing machine, which to be fair, it's probably not its fault. I should have had it serviced. Oh, I don't know, at least a year ago. And didn't. But while busting out this very nice machine and being terrified of it, I just remember those two weeks where my mom attempted to teach me how to use this thing, which maybe learning how to use a sewing machine while taking care of your mother is not the most ideal time to learn how to use a very fancy sewing machine. So I set it up, I turned it on, and I decided that that was enough for the night. With some fresh YouTube tutorials under my belt, I'm going to dive into day three because by golly, this project will not best me. I actually really debated just tossing this in the corner and being angry at it, but I decided that no, I promised you Miss Frizzle and Miss Frizzle I was going to give you. And now that the understitching that had thwarted my previous machine was now complete, I now get to move on to doing the bias binding on the underarm. Which I, again, watched a YouTube tutorial, and I realized my mistake from the last time was that I had not sewn the seam on the 45 with the grain of the bias. Instead, I had done a 90 on my daughter's dress, which is what had caused me the issue for that one. So with that information under my belt, I sewed those 45 degree angles in, and by golly, that works so much better. Gee, it's like it's supposed to be that way. And for some reason, I keep making these dresses that are bright red and I have exactly zero 
red metal side stock zippers. But for this one, I opted to use a wine colored because the fruit sort of went with the vibe of wine. Shh, don't tell me I'm wrong. I know it doesn't match. I'm just going with it. Because I also didn't have black. And yes, if you can believe it, I also hand basted the zipper in. I know, I don't know who I am either. What's going on? And even though I had black still threaded in there, I opted to switch to red because anal retentive. And I truly don't know what exactly is happening, but even I switched to a zipper foot, you guys. What is happening? Who am I? Not just moving the needle over and going with it. I guess that's what happens when you get forced on to a new machine and just have to sort of learn these things. Also, the foot that's on here normally I really don't actually like, so I was like, well, I can see the zipper foot more cleanly anyway. And in this tin is the giant pile of buttons which I did find some very fun black ones, two matching for the top where the bound buttonholes should have been and were not, and three to go along the pockets. And with a quick hand-sewn hem there, which is done in black so you can't actually tell how uneven the stitches are. Let's take a look at it. To the bus, she says. I feel like I did Miss Frizzle proud if she was from the 1950s and actually wore something other than long sleeves. So some final thoughts on this entire project. I really wanted this dress to look just as perfect as it did on the envelope. And while I got the lines, I think personally this front panel needed to be, for my size, at least two inches wider so that it more accentuated the curviness of my body as opposed to making me feel like I was wearing a 1990s jumper and walking around like an actual substitute teacher. One thing I did enjoy about doing this final look for y'all is that I did actually look at some photos of the original Miss Frizzle. I'm not talking about that new monstrosity that's coming out, no offense Kate McKinnon. And so that's why my makeup looks a little bit odd, because I actually tried to do her style, which is much thinner brows, and didn't hit myself with blush, so if I'm red, it's just because I was outside. And Florida. I did a very pale lip and did my hair uh, quite similarly to how I did it in the early 2000s. Except instead of the bun situation here, you would have had the flip up and then have like little feathers. That's what it was back in the 2000s for me. Other things I think I would have done differently is I definitely, I would have added less to the back and I would have added sl a slight bit along the front edge, even though that would have made this even more of a red situation. While I did try to embrace the color blocking, I'm not sure that I'm sold on it. I do actually like my little pockets that I made. And by little, I mean they're not little. They fit my entire phone. Cause pockets. It's 2020. Pockets. Overall, I don't really enjoy this particular dress pattern for me. Even if I were to do it all in one color, I don't think I would like the pattern any better. I like fuller skirts. I actually don't mind the sleeves work for me because I think they drape well enough, so that doesn't bother me. I will wear this in the future for other odd reasons, but I need to find a way to break up this very large sea of red that doesn't really flatter me at all. So if you have any ideas, go ahead and put them down in the comments because he help, help me. I don't know how to fix this. If you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and click that like button, making sure to subscribe so that you can see what I do with the fabric behind me in my next sewing project, and turning on the bell for post notifications so you can see all of my videos that I post along the way, because this is gonna take me a hot second. Thanks so much for watching, folks. See y'all next time. Fit everywhere, why don't you? Now I will be doing this using a vintage pattern, and I will be doing it with Pat with. Hmm. Now I will be using a vintage sewing pattern and the fabric that I cannot talk. What is that noise outside? Blurg. I think my other neighbors are jackhammering, are jackhammering up their sidewalk today. 
Yay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that Miss Frizzle is part of the reason why I am the way I am today. Now, am I going to dye my hair red? No. Why is my child upstairs? She's supposed to be in class. To the bus! Come on, everybody! To the bus! Yeah, I definitely feel like Miss Frizzle. This is frizzin' like, yeah. The frizz! But in the 50s. I know she wears long sleeves. It's Florida! Do you really think I can handle long sleeves? 